So we're in chapter 9. We're going to finish up auto cycle, move into diesel cycle. I know that there's something like a dual cycle, which is just a combination auto and diesel. I'm not really going to cover it. I don't ask any questions on exams about it, but it's in the textbook, okay? So we're going to focus on auto cycle, finish it up, and then get into diesel cycle. So I don't know if I covered this, but we have the piston uh, reciprocating motion in the cylinder and it goes down to the crank and you get that rotational motion. Okay, what is the bore? Symbol B, and you'll have the bore is the diameter of that cylinder. Okay, and then the stroke, what is the stroke? The stroke is the distance traveled uh, from the, think about the top of the piston, it goes from the bottom dead center location to the top dead center location. That's the, the extent of travel of that stroke. You can actually, uh, from kinematics, get it to the crank offset. If the crank offset is A, what is the stroke? Two times the crank offset. So if you want a large stroke, you get a larger crank offset. Okay, so that's our stroke. Uh, then you could talk about the displacement volume for that single cylinder in terms of the bore and the stroke. So the volume displacement is uh, the uh, pi r squared or pi bore squared divided by 4 times the stroke. And that'll be the displacement volume. That's the swept volume. Okay. The clearance volume is this volume when it's at top dead center that's still where the gases have been confined to or moved to. So that's the volume clearance and then what's the compression ratio? Well, the compression ratio in terms of the displacement volume and the clearance volume, you can work that out. You think, well, it's the volume at the bottom dead center divided by the volume at top dead center. Well, the volume at top dead center is only the clearance, only the clearance volume. But the volume at bottom dead center is both the clearance plus the displacement. All right, you ready to press on? Uh, mean effective pressure is a metric used in the textbook. What exactly is it? It's a very simple measure of the um, pressure um, for the whole cycle. Mean, mean, like an average, effective pressure for the whole cycle. So I like to put it in context of our auto cycle. We start with the volume at the bottom dead center and low pressure, we then compress to a volume at top dead center, and then we put constant volume heat transfer into it. We expand it then back down, so it's from state one to two to three to four. And then somebody says, what is the uh, work of the net cycle, the network out of the cycle? Wouldn't that be this area enclosed? on our PV diagram, that's a visual image of W net. That makes sense? So we have the power stroke is power out, but then your compression work in, so the difference is the network. Okay, somebody says I would like a very extremely simplified version of this. Well, don't change your two specific volumes. Leave them the specific volume bottom dead center the specific volume top dead center, right? And I want the same network, but I want to only talk about one effective pressure, one mean effective pressure. So if this rectangle has the same area, it would have the same network. And so the mean effective pressure times the, the volume bottom dead center minus the volume top dead center is equal to the network of the cycle. Somebody says, I think we were just introduced to something like this for that difference. Isn't that our displacement volume? Yeah, that's our displacement volume. So another way of writing the mean effective pressure is to say, calculate the network of the cycle, and then just divide it by the displacement volume. 
It's simply a metric. It's just a number, another number to represent the performance of that actual cycle. All right. So if you're going to get a large workout, you're going to have a high mean effective pressure. Okay. In summary, last time we talked about uh, if you're given a problem, let's say auto cycle, and you need to solve it, and they say, okay, use constant specific heats, well, then you would think about these equations, especially this one and this one, but for, they're for gases, ideal gas undergoing isentropic compression, we would use these equations if the constant specific heats. They're out of chapter six at the end of the entropy chapter. And then we would think of table A20 to get the values of C sub P, C sub V, and K, typically for air, because we do an air standard analysis for an auto cycle. But you have them for other gases as well. Last time we set up and solved the problem. Let me highlight, let me give you a roadmap for when you're solving a problem and you have all the information given and they say use constant specific heats. Well, first of all, make some diagrams. Diagrams. Make a good pressure volume diagram, a good temperature entropy diagram. There's not a lot of, uh, I don't know, variability. It's either an auto cycle, and we just have our standard numbering convention, one, two, three, four, for our states, and then process one to two, two to three, et cetera. Just follow the convention, you know, be able to trace that out. And in your mind, when you're tracing out these locations of states and the processes between, you're going through, oh, that's isentropic, oh, that's constant volume, oh, you know, whatever it is. And so you have this, make sure be able to do that. Once you have your property diagrams and your states labeled, then go ahead and construct a table of properties. And the two properties are really the pressure and the temperature. And you can also work with the specific volume, but this is kind of an optional property because you have Ks. And if you solve a few problems, you'll find, oh, I don't really don't even have to compute that specific volume as a number. But I do need the temperatures as a number. And the most important are the temperatures. Why? Because when I make my table, of energy transfers, this is another table, of energy transfers of my Q's and W's, I, I go back to my first law analysis and say, oh, that's equal to a change in U or a C sub V e delta T for that Q or that W. And so all of these Q's and W's are related to how the temperature has changed during the process. We did this before. So you diagrams, table of properties, table of energy transfers, and then finally you can compute your efficiencies, other metrics of interest, uh, thermal efficiency, displacement volume, mean effective pressure. Okay. One you'll notice right here is there's a simple equation for the thermal efficiency of the auto cycle, and I make a calculation and compare it to the detailed calculations done here. And they give the same answer to, as I'm showing, three significant digits. It would be even more significant digits, but it's shown at least three. So we want to take a look at where this equation, simple equation, come from. So this is, for the auto cycle, a very simple thermal efficiency equation. Let's take a look at it. 1 minus 1 over R to the K minus 1. Uh, remind me, what is R in this equation? Compression ratio, right, compression ratio. Typically around 10 for the auto cycle for gasoline engine spark ignition. Naturally aspirated, no turbocharger, supercharger, things like that. Okay, that's what R is in this equation. Hey, what's K in this equation? These are not tough qu questions I'm asking, right? But what is K? Ratio of? Specific heats, if we're doing a cold air standard analysis, so what's the ratio of specific heats for cold air around 300 Kelvin? It would be the number for K is 1.4. We use 1.4 again and again and again. Okay. Uh, and then you get the thermal efficiency. 
okay? For the cycle, what you have is you have some heat coming in from the hot source, and then you want to convert as much of that into work out. That's our traditional thermal efficiency. It's the same thermal efficiency here. Let's go ahead and derive that equation. So, so the thermal efficiency would be a ratio of how much, what fraction of the Q that comes into my cycle. Now, you made a property diagram, a PV property diagram. Does the heat that comes into the cycle, is that between states one and two? You know, is that during process one to two or process two to three or, or three to four or four to one? It's two to three, isn't it? That's our heat in. We're going to stay with that. And then we have our network, W net. And you can go with that W net in two ways. You can say, okay, well, that's going to be the work one to two, which is going to be a negative because it's compression, plus the work three to four, that's the power stroke. That's going to be a larger positive number. Or you could just say, you know what, work net is equal to Q net, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Now, in the Q net, just like in the work net, there's only two non-zero terms in the cycle. And so the Q net is going to be Q 2 to 3, that's positive in, plus Q 4 to 1, which is going to be a negative in, which is because it's a heat rejection. I'm going to stay with the sign convention, follow the textbook here. So our thermal efficiency is expressed as the ratio of Qs like this. Okay. We look back and we say, you know what, Q 2 to 3 is related to U3 minus U2 from a first law analysis. Likewise, Q4 to 1 is U1 minus U4. And the Q, whoops, 2 to 3 is U3 minus U2. Everything here up to this point is it works both for variable specific heats as well as constant specific heats. But if we make the additional assumption now that we're going to only use constant specific heats, then we can replace those changes in U by C sub V T3 minus T2 plus C sub V T1 minus T4 divided by C sub V T3 minus T2. And what cancels? The specific heats. And now I have it in terms of temperatures, right? Okay. Let's do this. Let's just do a little algebra. Is that equation equal to 1? And then I'm going to put a minus there, and I'm going to put a T4 minus T1 divided by T3 minus T2. Can you tell I've done this a few times? I feel bad. The first time students see something, it's over, overloading them, okay? But it, you, you, you probably have to go back and review, like, what, what is my next step, and what is going on here? Oh, that's just algebra at this point. That's just algebra right here. And then what you do is you go back in your mind and you have that PV diagram and you're thinking especially going from 1 to 2. And you say to yourself, I think I remember a relationship T2 divided by T1 is equal to V1 over V2. Hey, let's comp replace that with the compression ratio raised to the K minus 1 power. Is that true? Does that equation look familiar? Yeah. And then let's also do this. Think about from 3 back to 4. That's an expansion, isn't it? So I could put um, write the similar equation that T4 divided by T3 is equal to 1 over the compression ratio to the K minus 1. Thumbs up if you like both of those equations. Right? Yeah, we're going a little fast here. You have to remember your, your, your equations for constant specific heat. And then what I want to do is I want to uh, work with this equation a little bit. I want to put 1 minus, and then I need a little bit of room because I'm going to take that. Ah, let me put it over here. I'd even need more room. Just sort of put that in the corner. And we're going to have the efficiency, the thermal efficiency auto cycle is 1 minus. And then I'm going to put T4, and then we're going to do this. We're going to put the T1, and you have the minus sign, and then we're going to put T3, and then minus sign, 
uh, T2. And what we do is we divide both numerator, numerator and denominator by the T1, T1, like that. And this is uh, T1, and over here I put T1, and over here T1. It's just algebra, right? But I left a little room because I know where I'm going. And what I want to do is I want to push this T1 right there. Whoops. This T1 right there. Okay. <clears throat> and I want to put a T2 there and a T2 there. Did I make an error or does it look okay? Does it look okay? All right. And then likewise, I want to put one over T1 right over here. And I want to put T3 and T3 and T2 and then T2. So it's algebra, algebra to make it compact. This is a multiplication right there. All right. So... Um, Let's take a look at uh, this T4 divided by T3. I just got an expression for that, didn't I? Okay. And then let's take a look at T2 divided by T1. I just got an expression for that. Can you tell what happens when those two ratios of temperature multiply each other? You have the R to the k minus 1, but the other one is 1 over r to the k minus 1, and they cancel, and I'm just left with unity. They're like, wow, hey, I think the instructor's done this a few times. And uh, the first person that did this was a genius, right? They probably had a lot of dead ends and tried this and tried that. But anyway, there you go. That works, true? And so now I have the... the, the uh, the equation, I can rewrite it. The eta is equal to 1 minus. Then I'm going to have T3 divided by T2 minus 1. And then in the denominator, I look at it, and I'm going to pull out T2 over T1. And then I'm going to have T3 over T2 minus 1. Follow that? So guess what we can do? We're getting very, very close to where we want to be because it's 1 minus 1 over. What is T2 over T1? Go back up here. It's equal to R to the K minus 1. Bingo. There we go. QED. As the mathematicians say, what we set out to demonstrate, we've now demonstrated. Done. You're impressed, I can tell. Or you're asleep. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to do the uh, diesel cycle efficiency. That one, I have a YouTube video, and I put it out. Um, I also have this on YouTube. You can find it as well. Let's press forward. So one of the big things that that equation shows us for the thermal efficiency of the auto cycle is that it's a function of the compression ratio. And if you plot it, as the compression ratio goes up, the thermal efficiency of the cycle goes up. So if you want to buy a gallon of gas and really get as much power out of it as you can, mechanical power supplied by you know, making the engine do work, uh, you would put it into a high compression ratio engine. And people that buy performance cars have high compression ratio engines in them. So when you go up to the gas station and you want to fill up with gasoline, you're typically confronted with a big decision, right? Do you want to put in this type of unleaded, this type of unleaded, or that type of unleaded gasoline? Now, I'm just going to do a show of hands. How many people select the lowest cost, which is the lowest octane number gasoline when they put in? All right. How many people, if any, select the mid-grade couple? All right. How many people have to pay the highest price, the super? Oh, there is actually a few. Okay. So what motivates this choice? Well, this octane number is a measure of, not just price, yeah, that's right, but it's a measure of the anti-knock properties of the fuel. 
So it's less susceptible to self-ignition. When the spark gives it a kick, the spark plug goes and fires, then all three will burn really great. It'll combust. But um, some grades of gasoline have lower self-ignition temperatures or more susceptible to knock. And the higher, the octane rating, and if you look right here on, the, on your little pump or somewhere, they'll put R plus M divided by two research octane rating plus motor octane rating. The average is the one that everybody reports has been for a number of years. Okay, and you can look up what are the two different methods to actually measure that octane uh, in the lab or chemically in the fa uh, facility. Okay, so uh, what, what is this knock all about? Well, this is the way it's supposed to happen, normal combustion. And when the spark plug goes, then you have combustion coming into the air-fuel mixture. But as the piston's coming up toward top dead center, it's compressing the air-fuel mixture. The temperature and pressure are going up. And you could typically have some little hot spots, either on the valve, near the spark plug in a gap, or on the piston. And they could start combustion before the spark plug says go. The higher the octane, less susceptible to that. And then you would have this premature combustion. Now, modern engines, it's almost like nobody even knows it because you all have knock sensors. One knock sensor per cylinder. And the, the engine detects it before you can detect it and then retards and adjusts the timing. But if you have an older vehicle, like I've had a few, man, it was a big issue. And every time I wanted to move away from a you know, the light turned green, I wanted to accelerate, the people behind me were annoyed, but, but every time I pushed, I owned a car like this once, pushed on the gas, it seemed like the engine was going to come apart. That's the problem with the knock, before the knock sensors, right? And it's not good for the mechanical components in your engine for this. So that's what the, the octane number is for. Uh, if you pull out your owner's manual for your car, you can find where they say, oh, this car re requires this level, 91 octane gasoline, if you own a BMW. Now, a friend of mine owns a BMW, and he puts in the cheap grade gas. But then he drives like a grandfather, like he is. So he's not trying to rip and roar around the streets. It's This really comes into play when you're trying to demand some power out of your engine, not when you're idling. So anyway, and also they have the electronics that can retard it. So he's not going to get the performance out of it like they would report the high horsepower and high torque for if he did put in the high octane and then really uh, romped on the gas every now and then. Okay, so those that raise their hands, do you put it in because of the manufacturer's stipulation? No? Okay. What is a common misconception about octane? That after you pass this class, you will not have that misconception. Uh, the misconception is, is the higher the octane, because you had to pay more for it, you will get a higher MPG, miles per gallon. That is a misconception. And we don't want to you know, have some exposure to internal combustion engines and gasoline and octane and what it's all about and then walk out of this class and have a misconception. We don't want that, right? Okay, so uh, basically the heat content, the energy release is the same regardless of the three grades of gas. One gallon of gas, you perfectly combust it, you're going to get essentially the same amount of heat release out. Okay, so it's not like the, the, it's a higher energy release, hence you get more heat release. It's a heat engine, that's what an engine is, and then you get more power out. Nope, that's not the case. Okay, what it is is in the cycle, you can go with the higher compression ratio and you can get a higher thermal efficiency for the same amount of heat release for that one gallon of gas. So about a year ago, uh, the AAA had a study they put out, and it, it really made good circulation in the news. I heard it a couple times, and I saw it a couple um, news outlets. Uh, NPR had a good um, um, 20, 
I don't know how long they do it, two or three minute segment on it. But anyway, they did a, lot, a survey and they found that a lot of drivers who don't need the higher octane gasoline purchase it anyway. And I can see that. I mean, I've seen people, they name their cars. They talk to their cars. They actually pet their cars. They wash them and they talk to them all the time and wax them. And then when they, on the weekend, they're feeling good, they're going to splurge a little bit. They buy some beverages. I'm sure it's coffee Friday night. You know, you're going to splurge for your stomach. And then you're filling up your friend, you know, your gas tank, your special pet car. And you're going to say, I'm going to treat my car to high octane. I feel like splurging. Well, you can do that, but it's just, you know, money down the, down the drain, right? You get a bigger, bigger beverage of coffee. That's better expense on the weekend there as you celebrate the weekend coming. But anyway, they did it and they found that a lot of people didn't really know what they were buying. And when they just went up there, they just felt rich that day or poor that day. And then they switched around a couple of times. Now, my brother tells me that uh, the alcohol content in the, some of the low grade gas is higher than the high grade gas. And so when he mixes it and puts it in his little lawnmower engines and stuff, he never buys the low grade gas. I don't know. I never investigated. Anybody investigate that? The opposite. I've heard that they use the ethanol to raise the octane of the lower grade fuel. Okay, that's right. But the ethanol is worse on the gaskets. Right. And the bulb, like the on your uh, your primer bulb. And I had one time, and it, I didn't use it for, you know, winter, and then I came back, and my primer bulb was like, it left, it went mushy black rubber, and it went all over my thumb. And my brother said, oh, that's the, you, you need to buy it, the higher octane gas because it has lower ethanol. That's what I, that's what he said. Would you confirm that? or? I, I So the debate continues and I'm lost. I have no, I can't help you on this. Does anybody else, you come to my office and explain it if you've worked it out. All I know is now my brother told me now I'm doing this, right? It's probably not a great reason, but I haven't had problems with the bulb or the, the primer bulbs since. But it, it sounds like it's just the opposite. Anybody ever had a primer bulb and then they like, hey, this thing deteriorated? You did? That's it. Yep. Stable type of additive? Okay. Yeah. The bulbs, what does somebody say? They're not that expensive? Yeah, but it's the painful experience of having to go find one, buy it, and you probably at least. Yeah, well, you have to go to the store and find it. Waste of time. It used to not have problems like this. <laughs> we have somebody who's rich. <laughs> yeah. Are you good to what? Yeah, you can. Yeah. And then you see your neighbor. He'll have. Uh, he'll get the electric tape out again and again. And after a couple seasons, it'll be like black on this section, black, because they run over the cord. Yeah. But you're right, you could do that. All right, so let's press on. There, I just did some checking uh, recently, and there have been some excellent videos put out recently. Uh, I, I, I'm not familiar, that familiar with Engineering Explained, but um, I'll tell you what, if you put out a video on horsepower versus torque, a simple explanation, and in three weeks, you have that many views on an engineering topic. I mean, this is not dancing. I mean, this is, people go to the, 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 watch this stuff on YouTube for entertainment. But this is incredible. Look at that. Three weeks, he has over a million views on something just explaining uh, power versus torque. And this is a very good explanation, I can tell, because it's the crank offset that gives you the, the just from statics, that, this moment arm displacement, which gives you the high torque. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Um, and then it talks about some newer engines coming out. Variable compression. So you, it changes from like 8 to 9 to 10 to 11. Uh, I, this is now 
production. And uh, who who does the infinity? Not Mazda. It's Nissan. Nissan. So has anybody been in one of these vehicles? You have. You have. Okay. Is there a performance difference in this? Have you been in one that has this variable compression engine? Is it just coming out? Okay, whatever, yeah. Uh, also, Mazda's, this is homogeneous, homogeneous charge compression ignition engine, the holy grail of gasoline, where it's not the spark ignition, the compression ignition. People have been working on that for many years. So there's a lot of pretty neat videos. I mean, one week and three quarters, or a third of a million views, 300,000 views. So um, pretty good. I encourage you, if you're interested in it, there you go. Am I going to show them in class? Nah. All right, what happens if they say variable specific heats? Well, don't give up. Just uh, go and review Chapter 6. And you have this ratio, P sub R and V sub R's, for isentropic air only. We have table A22, the air table. We have these columns, P sub R and V sub R, P sub R and V sub R. We use them for the isentropic compression and expansion. Um, should I spend some time solving a problem with that or moving the diesel? Let's vote. Spend some time on this problem. All right, moving the diesel. <laughs> Everybody was sleeping. Should we revote? Yes. It was like national election, 10% participation. All right, spend some time on this one and move into diesel. Okay, we're going to spend a little time on this one. So you read the problem carefully, air standard auto. And they give you initial temperature, initial pressure at the start of the compression stroke. That's T1 and P1. The compression ratio, 10 and a half. The maximum temperature of the cycle is 1,800 Kelvin. Now use variable specific heats. How many times have I given a problem on in a test and I've emphasized? I say, read the problem statement. If it says variable specific heats, are you going to use K? The ratio of specific heats be 1.4 constant. No, 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 no. And yet I'll find students mix and match. Don't do it. You're stuck going a different route as soon as it's variable specific heats. All right, the temperature at the end of the compression stroke. You know, we did that for these numbers with the assumption of cold air analysis, constant specific heat. That's our answer. But if you use the variable, you'll get a different answer. And this always perplexes students. You mean I have two methods of analyzing the same problem? But one is going to give a different answer than the other? Yeah. Well, which one's better? Well, first of all, both of them are an approximation, the auto cycle. Okay. It's, that's a big approximation as is. But thinking that you are counting for temperature-dependent specific heats, that one would be a little more accurate. All right. So how do we do that? Well, we come in and we say, during the, the process from 1 to 2, it's isentropic. S2 is equal to S1. And it's air, isentropic. And we think, OK, we're going under a particular uh, volume ratio. So we have that V2, um, let me do it this way, V1 over V2 is equal to the compression ratio, is it not? And from our previous, um, let me jump back here. This equation, 6.42 is the equation we want to use when we're given the change in the volume, V2 over V1. So that's 1 over the compression ratio is equal to V sub R2 divided by V sub R1. Air only, boom. So you, you um, have at the 300 Kelvin, I don't know if I have it, did I scoot down enough? Did we start at 300 Kelvin? What was that initial temperature? Yeah, 300 Kelvin. We come over here and we look, and there's V sub R1. It's 621.2. Okay. So V sub R2 is equal to V sub R1 times 1 over the compression ratio. 
So we're going to put the 621.2 divided by 10.5, my memory's correct, and you get a number. Look now in the rest of the table for where you can match that new V sub R2. And that's what tells you then, oh, let me see what it is. So V sub R2 is going to be, what's that, almost 60, 59, 59.16. So we come back over here and we start looking for 59.16, and I didn't put it in. It's truncated. So you match it up and interpolate. And when you interpolate, you find that its temperature is around 743. So that's our temperature at state 2, 743. All right, what about the peak pressure? Um, do we go and use the piece of R's? Because we use the V of R's to get the temperature, maybe we use the piece of R's? No, 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 no. Okay, so um, let's go back. Does it always behave as an ideal gas? Even though I have variable specific heat assumption, is it still always an ideal gas? With confidence? Yes, with confidence, thank you. So what we do is we say that P2 V2 divided by T2 is equal to P1 V1 divided by T1. That's a good use of the ideal gas equation. Let's do this. I'll just check off and I'll say that I know the ratio of the volumes. That's my compression ratio. The T1 and T2, we just calculated T2. T1 was given. P1 is given. The only unknown in that equation is P2. And that's how you calculate it. Okay, so if we want, you could write it out that P2 is equal to P1 times... Uh, V1 over V2 is the compression ratio, and then you're going to have T2 divided by T1, and you just calculated it. So you end up calculating this pressure, 2470. All right. Okay. Then the peak pressure that you need to calculate is the pressure at state 3. You still use the same ideal gas equation at P3. V3 divided by T3 is equal to, you could put P2, V2 divided by T2. The volume between 2 and 3 don't change. We just calculated P2, T2. T3 is a given. It's 1800 Kelvin. Hence, you calculate the pressure at state um, 3. And it comes in at uh, almost 6,000 kilopascal. All right, how about the heat addition for the cycle? Well, you go back to the Q2 to 3, that's what comes in the heat addition, and that's going to be U3 minus U2. I have to get the internal energies out of the table. Here are the column of internal energies. And so the first one... Well, whatever, I, th I don't think I'm on this table, right? It was too high a temperature and I truncated it. But you, you pick up that internal energy, U at state 2, and then the U at state 3. State 3 has a temperature of 1800 Kelvin, and U2, we already worked on that. It was the same line as we had the T2. All right. So you get those out of the tables, take the difference, and now you can put in the 940.8. Probably what I would do is I would finish out this whole table of properties first and then go back and you're basically constructing this part of the second table, the heat energy transfer uh, table. All right, but how about the network of the cycle? Well, you're going to get the, the, the work here. What is the work? 1 to 2, is that the internal energy at state um, 1 minus internal energy at state 2 from the first law? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And that's going to come in negative. And likewise, this work, um, uh, 3 to 4, is the work state 
3 minus, not the word, the u state 3 minus u state 4. And when you do the sum, this is the net work for the cycle, comes in 527. Thermal efficiency, the thermal efficiency is the work net divided by the Q2 to 3, that's our heat in. So this 527.3 divided by the 940.8, and it comes in around 56%. And then the last, the mean effective pressure. The mean effective pressure, you have to just remember what that definition is. It's the network of the cycle, which is 527.3, divided by our displacement volume, our V displacement. Okay, how do I calculate the displacement volume? Well, here's the numbers right here, but how do I calculate it? Uh, how do I calculate the displacement volume? Yeah, that's a little <laughs> twist there. How do I, you have to think about that one for a little bit. So let's do this. Um, is the displacement volume equal to the larger volume at the beginning of the compression minus the volume at the end of the compression? Yeah, that's true. And the, is the compression ratio V1 divided by V2? Yeah, so let's use that, those two pieces of information and let's put uh, V1 times 1 minus what is V2 is 1 over R times V1. So I pull the V1 out. Did I do too many algebraic steps to go from here to here? Okay. Now you say to yourself, can I calculate the specific volume at state 1? We just go back to the ideal gas equation. P1, B1 is equal to RT1, so that V1 is equal to RT1 divided by P1. So stick that in there. We have our compression ratio. Now we have our displacement volume. Maybe your mind works a little differently. Maybe you can get it a different way, but it, there's only one right answer. And there, that's how you would get it. All right, a uh, little quick question. Did I put R up here anywhere? No. Oh, here's R bar. Oh, no. Did I typo? That's a typo, isn't it? What is R bar? That's not R bar. That's R. See that? Isn't this R for our air? 0.287. Well, yeah, you can, and I probably did. But another way of doing it is, yeah, there's, um, I can breathe through my nose, I can breathe through my mouth. So, you know, professor, you want to breathe? Why don't you just use your nose and breathe through it? Okay, it was right there, yes. <laughs> I could have. <laughs> You're right. All right. Um, this is a typo right here. This is R. What is the relationship between R bar and R? We covered that again and again. You divide it by the molar mass, and that's R for the gas of interest for air. And so this R is for air, the gas constant for air. That's the numeric value, so that's how you... So that's how I calculated V1 right here. Okay. Yep. All right, so... There you go. We're done with that problem. So we're done with the auto cycle. Let's move into the diesel cycle.